It's 1986, and moviegoers the world over are enamored by the smash hit movie Top Gun. While real US Navy flyers cringed at its portrayal of their profession, the movie nevertheless inspired an entire generation of young men and women to become fighter pilots and take to the skies for an adventure unlike any other. But while the movie may have catapulted its lead actor in the form of Tom Cruise to superstardom, arguably the biggest star to emerge from the film was the F-14 Tomcat. Before Top Gun's release, only military and aviation enthusiasts really appreciated this aircraft. But afterwards, the big carrier fighter earned its place in American pop culture. Coming to symbolize 1980s Americana bleeding national pride and patriotism with MTV and the spirit of adventure all within one aircraft. However, even as the movie was still playing in theaters, F-14s were flying into real danger zones across the globe, if not protecting the US mainland, then safeguarding American interests. Almost mimicking the climax of the movie, on more than one occasion, Tomcats found themselves engaged with hostile aircraft, particularly in the Mediterranean, where Libya's Colonel Gaddafi sent his air force to challenge American intentions. Gaddafi's air force was supplied with inferior Soviet export types, and so were little threats to the mighty F-14, which chalked up several kills in this period. That would change, as war erupted in the Middle East and the United States found itself at odds with an enemy equipped with advanced weapons they had previously supplied when said enemy was an ally. This is the story of an air battle fought over the Strait of Hormuz that had more drama than any movie could ever conceive of and had the potential of sparking a much wider conflict if things were allowed to escalate out of control. In this battle, the legendary F-14 would battle other US-built aircraft and face a very real threat. Today's episode of Wars of the World is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. The internet is our most powerful tool at Wars of the World, where the majority of our research takes place. It provides us with access to news, information, and a place to share documents and data alongside various streaming platforms to find valuable information on the topics we cover. The problem is, sometimes that critical documentary isn't available in the country we're located, and public Wi-Fi leaves us concerned about sharing files across easily accessible servers. Luckily, with Surfshark VPN, those concerns are solved. Surfshark VPN is an unparalleled virtual private network with easy-to-navigate security features meant to mask your online activity. All of your internet browsing, including where you're doing it from, is protected with military-grade encryption to prevent people from snooping in. This allows you to share files easily, access your bank accounts, and feel confident wherever you are, even when using shared Wi-Fi. Surfshark VPN also allows you to change your location in real time to one of many servers found all over the globe. This means that if a certain film or documentary we need for research is unavailable in our country, we can simply travel to a different part of the world via Surfshark and access that media in a matter of seconds. It's a seamless, risk-free process. Surfshark VPN also includes a no-strings-attached, no-logs policy meaning your data will never be collected or sold, no matter what. You can also enjoy the peace of mind of a cookie pop-up blocker and clean web initiative, where millions of phishing scams and malicious websites are automatically blocked for your convenience. Sign up for Surfshark VPN using the link in the description below and enter promo code WOTW for 83% off and an additional three months free. The internet is an unpredictable place, Use Surfshark VPN to make it secure. With the gearing up of the Cold War in the decade after the end of the Second World War, the United States adopted a policy of containment regarding the Soviet Union and sought allies in key strategic regions to help box in the vast communist superpower. 
The most obvious example of this policy was, of course, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, which helped defend Western Europe, but there were other alliances established on the geopolitical map with the same goal and which enjoyed Western support. One such alliance, located in the strategically vital Middle Eastern region, was the Baghdad Pact, established in 1955, which included Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, and Turkey, with the United Kingdom representing the West, and later providing a nuclear deterrence on behalf of the member states. From the start, the alliance was fraught with difficulties regarding infighting and mistrust between its members. Coupled with the frustration that the UK, as the West's representative, would not act in support of Pakistan in its conflicts against non-member India and Iraq, facing growing concerns over Israel. The Israeli question was also what kept the United States out of the alliance formally, although it provided training, equipment, and financial aid to members. Solely on the basis of such assistance being used to confront Soviet expansion and communist insurgencies in the region. When the Iraqi monarchy was overthrown in 1958, Iraq withdrew from the alliance, and with Iraq went the Iraqi capital's name, Baghdad. The treaty was now called the Central Treaty Organization, or CENTO for short, with its headquarters relocated to Ankara, Turkey. Despite its problems, the remaining members of the alliance enjoyed considerable support from the United States, provided that it was used in support of US and UK goals in the region. Iran, in particular, was able to accumulate a massive military force of predominantly American and British weapon systems that were superior to anything else in the region, including, for a time, that of Israel. By far the most celebrated weapon system sold to Iran was the F-14 Tomcat, the government in Tehran being the only customer for the aircraft outside the US. Then, almost overnight, everything changed. In 1979, amidst growing unrest, the Shah of Iran abdicated, and the country was rocked by revolution with the new ideologically motivated leadership under Ayatollah Khomeini being distinctly anti-Western. Cento collapsed, and the US was now forced to confront the realization that a major new threat had appeared in the Middle East, armed to the teeth with US weapons. However, it would be Iran's former ally Iraq, now under the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein, that would instead take the lead in confronting the new regime in Tehran. On September 22nd, 1980, Hussein's air force attacked Iranian bases as a precursor to an invasion. It was his hope that with Iran still destabilized in the wake of the revolution, they would be unable to organize an effective resistance. However, this was a grave miscalculation. The Iraqi invasion galvanized the Iranian people into action to expel Hussein's forces, stalling it and leaving the two sides fighting to an almost total stalemate for the next eight years. Unable to decisively defeat the Iraqis in battle, the Iranians therefore decided to go after Iraqi oil in an effort to starve Hussein's army of its funding, attacking refineries, storage depots, and Iraq's logistical infrastructure, including its relatively few harbors. So effective was this campaign that Iraq was essentially bankrupted, forcing Hussein to rely on cash injections from Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, neither of whom wanted to see an Iranian victory in the conflict. Meanwhile, the Iraqis attempted their own similar campaign, but lacked the aircraft comparable to the Iranian McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom II, which was the backbone of the Iranian Air Force, having the range and firepower to fight its way to and from targets in Iraq. Therefore, Hussein decided to instead go after Iran's tankers, which were extremely vulnerable as they attempted to sail through the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz. Acquiring missiles from France, Iraq initiated what would be termed in the Western press as the Tanker War. Iran naturally followed suit, attacking Iraqi tankers, and so, in an effort to protect Iraqi oil exports, Baghdad turned to Kuwait's tanker fleets to export its oil but Tehran didn't see any distinction and began attacking these as well. The situation was deteriorating out of control and Kuwait demanded help from US President Ronald Reagan, warning him that if help didn't come, then Kuwait would turn to the Soviets, a totally unthinkable prospect for Reagan at this key juncture in the Cold War's final phase. 12 Kuwaiti supertankers were reflagged as US vessels in the hope this would dissuade Iran from attacking them 
as they would now have to effectively attack the United States to target oil. However, fearing this would not be enough, in July of 1987, the US initiated Operation Earnest Will. The operation would see the US return to a tried and tested method of protecting merchant shipping, the convoy, and Earnest Will would be the largest such convoy operation since the end of World War II, involving scores of American warships covering the safe transit of Allied merchant ships through the Gulf. However, even with the advanced technologies of the United States Navy and key allies like Britain and France, the risk was high. Even before the tanker war began, the US destroyer USS Stark was accidentally fired upon by an Iraqi aircraft, the Iraqis mistaking the ship for being Iranian. Then, just two days after Ernest Will commenced on July 22, 1987, the tanker MV Bridgeton, formerly a Kuwaiti tanker and the sixth largest ship in the world at the time, struck a mine. Fortunately, the double hull of the 400,000 ton vessel prevented it from sinking but the incident highlighted the risks that would be involved in the coming months. The Iranians, meanwhile, seemed unintimidated by the American presence, instead viewing it as a return of the Western Crusaders who had come to crush their Islamic Republic. Using their American-built warplanes, they took to the skies, testing the resolve of the Americans, and in particular, the fighter pilots of the US Navy, flying their movie star F-14 Tomcats. Sailing in the Gulf of Oman, as Ernest Will got underway, was a US Navy carrier battle group centered around the USS Constellation, on board which was Carrier Air Wing 14. Providing air superiority duties for the carrier group and the ships and aircraft involved in the operation was VF-21, known as the Freelancers, equipped with the F-14A Tomcat. The F-14 was ideally suited to this task, having a good loiter time over the operational area, being able to carry a wide array of weapon types and possessing its own powerful radar in the form of the Org 9 set, which could detect a fighter-sized target out to a range of 115 nautical miles and engage up to six aircraft at one time. However, despite this performance, which surpassed the Iranian Phantoms by a considerable margin, the Tomcats were not expected to find their own targets. Instead, they would rely on the E-2C Hawkeye airborne early warning aircraft. Performing a similar role to the much larger US Air Force AWACS, the E-2s used their powerful radars, located in a 24-foot diameter rotating dish above the fuselage, to monitor air activity in and around the convoys, as well as peeking into Iran to monitor Iranian Air Force activities giving convoys much greater warning times should Tehran decide to launch an attack. Very quickly, the need for effective air defense was realized when on July 24th, a flight of Iranian F-4 Phantom IIs approached a convoy, coming to within 15 miles before veering off following the appearance of the mighty Tomcats. However, it was not just mines and aircraft that threatened shipping under US protection. Iran had also begun receiving land-based silkworm anti-ship missiles from China, which, while primitive compared to American or French counterparts, had a relatively large warhead that could inflict very heavy damage on anything it hit. Hidden on the Iranian coastline, there was significantly less warning of an impending attack when these weapons were fired, thus making it all the more difficult for US warships to initiate countermeasures effectively. Locating these weapons, therefore, became a high priority, and this fell to the US Navy's land-based Lockheed P-3C Orion Maritime Patrol aircraft, flying from Oman and using the Reef Point Communications Intelligence, or Comint, system. One such operation was being undertaken by a P-3C on the morning of August 8th, 1987. As it patrolled above the Strait of Hormuz, an E-2C Hawkeye was scanning the airspace around the Iranian base, when it started detecting activity indicating that the Iranians were launching aircraft. Given the performance of the radar track, the operators on the E-2C identified an F-14 Phantom taking off and immediately informed a pair of VF-21 F-14 Tomcats on a combat air patrol nearby. Observing the Phantom, its intentions were clear as it flew just several hundred feet off the deck in the direction of the patrolling P-3C Orion 
trying to conceal as much of its approach from American radars as possible by hiding in the ground clutter before racing out over the ocean. To further conceal their approach, they relied on Iranian ground radar controllers to vector them to their targets, since their own radar would alert the Americans to their presence, switching it on only when they got into weapons range. The Iranians, only detecting the four-engine patroller, saw an opportunity for a quick kill against this highly valuable American asset, seemingly unaware that the US Navy had taken steps to protect it. The operators aboard the Hawkeye advised the Orion of the danger, and it quickly turned south to put as much distance between it and the Phantom as possible, but the much faster Phantom was closing in, and so the Tomcats were ordered to intercept. Flying that day was F-14 pilot Lieutenant William Ferron, call sign Bear, who was undertaking his first ever operational cruise, and was acting as wingman to his flight leader and squadron commanding officer, Lieutenant Commander Robert Clement. As the Hawkeye guided the Tomcats in behind the Phantom, which in turn was still pursuing the Orion, numerous warnings were issued over the radio, none of which had gotten a response. Upon learning of the Phantom, Ferran had expected the intercepts to go like previous encounters, where the Iranians would get so far and then back off, but this time seemed different. This time, the Iranian aircraft was hell-bent on making its attack. With warnings having been issued and ignored, and the Phantom in attack position, the Tomcats were left with no choice but to engage the plane. If they didn't, and the Orion was shot down, not only would a highly valuable aircraft be lost, but as many as 11 Americans would be killed. The Tomcats turned on their Org 9 sets, but the poor weather of the day played havoc with the powerful radars, as thick clouds, some of which contained particles of sand scooped up from the desert, confused the image on their screens. Eventually, Ferran was able to get a strong feed on the Iranian plane, and so Clement ordered him to take the lead in the intercept. Meanwhile, the Iranian Phantom crew had turned on their own radar sets, and were now getting a lock on the Orion which was still trying to flee the scene some 11 miles ahead. Once they were sure they had a good lock, the Phantom squeezed the trigger and the Sparrow missile slung under its fuselage dropped away before igniting its rocket motor and racing towards its target. The Sparrow required the launch aircraft to keep its radar locked on the target during its entire flight in order to guide its path, with the weapon having no independent guidance system of its own. The drawback to this, of course, was that the launch aircraft was extremely vulnerable during this time, having to keep flying with its nose facing the targets. A serious problem, as the Phantom's own radar warning systems alerted the pilot that he was being targeted by the pursuing F-14s. Having locked onto the Phantom, Ferran and his weapon officer launched their own AIM-7 Sparrow missile, a more advanced F model. From his aircraft, Clement observed the Sparrow detach from Ferran's Tomcat, but instead of racing away once clear of the F-14, the weapon continued to drop, its rocket motor having malfunctioned and failed to ignite. The Tomcats were now in a scramble to fire again, both aircraft aiming a single Sparrow each and firing them at the Phantom, these ones igniting and racing off in pursuit while trailing thick white smoke. The Phantom knew the game was up, and so broke off its engagement, leaving its Sparrow to go dumb as the radar lost sight of the Orion. The Phantom raced back down toward the sea, punching through a thick cloud base as it went, but not before the pilots observed a flash near the aircraft as one of the missiles detonated in their rear hemisphere, damaging the tail, but not enough to destroy the plane as it limped back to base. Having seen the blast of the Sparrow as it detonated near the Phantom before it disappeared into the clouds, Clement and Ferran were sure they had shot the Iranian plane down. However, this was later disproved. Despite this, the mission was still a resounding success, that being to prevent the Iranians from shooting down the Orion, which the Americans had achieved without loss to themselves. In this regard, the F-14s were credited with a soft kill, however celebrations were short-lived. Although no one had been killed, the incident had the potential of escalating the conflict beyond protecting Western interests, and risked drawing the US deeper into the Iran-Iraq war. 
As a result, the incident was initially covered up, but within days, American journalists had learned something had happened in the skies over the Strait of Hormuz and began asking questions. This led to the suggestion that there had never been any Iranian aircraft in that area, and the whole incident was the result of a confused radar picture created by atmospheric conditions present at the time. Essentially, what was being claimed was that the Tomcats had fired missiles at clouds, since during the whole engagement, visual contact between the Tomcats and the Phantom was never made. Understandably, this explanation was met with anger by all those involved, who rebuffed such claims, pointing out that the Phantom had been tracked all the way to and from its base, flying at hundreds of miles an hour, quite fast for a cloud. Also, further evidence was found when a picture emerged of the Phantom with its tail damaged by the Sparrow's detonation. This experience, early in his career, left Farron with a sour taste in his mouth, and he would cite it as one of the reasons for him eventually leaving the Navy earlier than he had planned. As the details began to come out, the press was also quick to jump on the poor performance of the Sparrow missile, and questions were raised about how effective US and NATO air superiority fighters were since the Sparrow was the standard medium-range weapon at the time. The US Navy and Air Force both emphasized their confidence in the Sparrow, but it would not be until the 1991 Gulf War, where the weapon proved its worth, that confidence was fully restored. And there you have the tale of the soft kill over Hormuz, the real-life Top Gun. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.